So you already know I'm Rick Farrow. Uh, I got involved with security in 1984. And really, after all these years, it's been getting rather depressing because you keep seeing the same problems over and over again. Also, I kept writing about this stuff. And finally, I said, well, I should do more than just write. People don't seem to be paying enough attention. So I came up with this talk. Okay, I've given this talk for Bay Lisa at uh, Usenix in Boston at Apple last Friday. They really need it. And I thought that this would be a good audience. Now, I originally planned on this being two hours of lots of audience participation. Then I was told this was supposed to be a one-hour talk. All right, so we have leveraged 90 minutes. So there can be some, some audience participation, especially after you get about past the halfway point, you'll notice that there's places for you to intervene and share your experience. And that's important because I want to get something out of this talk as well. So obviously security is broken, right? This is not a mystery. We really know this is true. The really bad thing is that we have accepted that security is broken. And that's what's unacceptable to me. We just go, oh well, so what? Two thirds of all desktops are owned, right? They're, they have some kind of malware installed on them. Hundreds of thousands of bots out there. Monthly security patches are just the norm. It's not anything special at all, right? You expect that on a certain Tuesday in the month, Microsoft is putting out security patches. No surprise. Applications rely on, level, on layers of software. Now, I'm going to get into this much more deep, deeply in the next couple of slides. But I think the scariest thing of all is that web browsers, by design, expect to execute remote code. Right? So you browse the web, you visit some site, and what do you get? Who knows? Who looks? And that's by design. And that's really scary. We have insecurity and depth. Take a current OS. Nice examples, FreeBSD, about 3 million lines of code just in the kernel. Linux, over 5 million lines of code just in the kernel. OK, so those are nice examples. There are also third-party device drivers so that the people who are writing the code don't have necessarily total control over what goes in their OS. Not so much of Linux and BSDs, but with other vendors like Apple and Microsoft. Multiple APIs as well. Kernel privileges, the kernel can do everything, which I'll talk about, right? Probably everyone here knows this, but I want to really pound this point home that hardware can be our friend, and it doesn't necessarily work as our friend. Kernel privileges get extended via services that run with privileges. Anything that runs as a local system under Windows, things that run as root under Linux, this is an extension of kernel privileges. So now we have taken our kernel, which is already way too big, and we've made it even bigger, many times bigger than the three to five million lines of code. If all we have is three to five million lines of code in kernel, at three to six defects per thousand lines of code, which is a reasonable amount, we're talking tens of thousands of defects. Do you think we'll ever find them all? So perhaps things will get better over time. Much work has been done to improve security over the, over the last several years. We have Microsoft's Trusted Computing Initiative, right? launched, uh, I think, in February of 2000. Very exciting. I think the, the way they celebrated that is they got denial of service. Their name servers were all in the same subnet. And so they were knocked off the internet for about 30 hours. Nice way to start. Uh, code reviews for buffer overflows have become very, very popular. Now, has code gotten better? There's a, a paper that was presented at Usenix Security just last month, uh, excuse me, two months ago now, time flies, by um, Andy Osmond and Schechter that show that OpenBSD has gotten better over time, that they actually have been able to remove a fair number of flaws from the system. And they're seeing a slight decline and the number of new vulnerabilities failed. So yeah, it's possible. Let's pick something that's really popular, something that we've been looking at for many, many years, buffer overflows. How many years have buffer overflows been around? First discussed inside the NSA in 1974. First practical example, 1988, the internet worm woke up a lot of people. 
So it wasn't until 1996 that this became really popular when Aleph One, better known today as Elias Levy of uh, Bug Track, wrote a very nice paper called um, Smashing the Stack for Fun and Profit, really explained this in details that a freshman student in college could understand. How could he do this? He was teaching freshman computer science at Berkeley at the time. Okay, there have been other ex explanations of this. It just hadn't worked. He succeeded. Then we started seeing the buffer overflows. So, how do you get rid of this? Well, first thing you can do is very, very simple tools. Tools like grip, right? Look for string copy. Look for get s. And when you find those things, remove them. So that's the first thing you do. I don't know how much Microsoft paid for their tool. And you can be sure it wasn't grep. Next, software that checks for stack corruption. This was invented, well, it's more or less invented by uh, Crispin Coat and his friends in 1998. And it was called StackGuard. StackGuard is we use a, a canary. You put a canary on the stack. A canary is just a secret value. It's known by the when you run the system, when you run a program, the function call preamble, as part of its work to set up a function call, puts the canary below the return address on the stack. So anything that tries a buffer overflow and replace the return address will theoretically overwrite the canary. Now, from that, Microsoft came up with some similar but not the same scheme. Of course, they'd have to, you know, it's hard to license open source so other people can't use it. So they had to come up with a different scheme, but that's been broken as well. Then there's the use of no exec stacks. Let's do it in hardware. Now, this has been a problem for Intel and AMD until recently because their designs didn't allow you to make a stack both writable and not executable. If it was writable, it was executable as well. So that's an issue. Okay, but the idea of a no exec stack is if you're not executing code off the stack, why do you need execute permissions there? So people can't just load in code to execute on the stack because now you have hardware protection that's going to prevent you from executing it. That sounds pretty good, right? Newer Intel processors, AMD processors, Spark processors since the early 90s have been able to do this. So, have things gotten better? Well, at first glance, maybe. CVE, how many people know what CVE is? Okay, this is like a defense contractor based in Virginia, MITRE, and they've had a uh, vulnerability database for a number of years. And it's like, if you, go to, if you go to, say, Security Focus, if you use Snort, they'll have a reference to CVE for the very vulnerability they're checking for. So that's one way of thinking of it. So they keep track of vulnerabilities. In the last five years, the first four of those five years, buffer overflows were number one. They have fallen to number four. Top three are web scripting errors. Cross-site scripting, well, maybe that's more of a browser error. SQL injection and PHP include. Here's what it looks like. Uh, so, you, of course, you can't see the legends back here or probably on TV. This is cross-site scripting. Here is SQL injection. Here's our buffer overflows. And here's PHP file include, which seems to be the lamest thing I've ever seen in my life. But it's, it's look at it, it's creeped, crept up there quite a bit. Now, what you, I really want you to pay attention to is look at this line. I mean, if we sort of drew like, oh my god. If I drew like a line through here, it sort of looks like this, doesn't it? Keep in mind that they ended 2006, which is what it says here, in September. So we're not even finished the year yet. The reality, no improvement. Despite all the work that's been done to get rid of buffer overflows in very common software, we're still seeing the same number of vulnerabilities approximately in the last five years. Now, the top new vulnerabilities are all related to web script and programmer, web scripting and programming errors, right? Misleading, as there's many more web scripts, and of course, cross-site scripting is 
that's really not a web scripting error, but it, that it applies to web browsers. So has, have things gotten any better in the last five years? I would say not. People are certainly more aware of security, but things have not, have not gotten better. So maybe we should blame Dennis Ritchie. After all, he invented the C programming language that had things like string copy and unbounded arrays. I, I guess I don't see anyone saying, yeah, yeah, let's, let's hang him from the nearest oak tree. No, we don't want to do that. Dennis is really a nice guy. It's just that he's a genius. He happened to write a programming language so he and his buddies could make their operating system, which they'd written in a few days, portable. OK, how many people do this? Not many. So why do we give everybody C? It's my favorite macro assembler. OK, it's very handy. It's very fast. And it's really much too easy just to blame Dennis Ritchie because, look, there's other problems. All these languages have had problems, including Java, which is designed with a security in mind. OK, has it worked? Maybe we should go back to the beginning. Mainframes. Isn't that amazing? Some people in this room probably weren't even born. And the problems we're dealing with today were being created. How sad is that? OK, mainframes, there were these amazing machines, filled up whole rooms. You know, you could probably put about 20 megabytes on a dishwasher size disk pack. Very exciting. Great air, air handling system, so I loved them. Now, in the early days, mainframes were single user machines. When I got to college in 1968, that's how the mainframes there worked. They didn't have these new uh, attachments, as it were. You submitted your jobs as a punch card deck. It got written to mag tape and submitted as a batch job to the computer. My god, it was amazing. Now, about this time, people started inventing time sharing systems. That's what CTSS stands for. Computer time sharing system. Ooh, wow. Multics, 1965. Okay. What were they trying to do? They had this huge resource, and rather than run one program at a time, they wanted to allow multiple people to use these multi million dollar machines more with the appearance of simultaneity. So the big issue here became users. Still an issue of computers today. Right? If we didn't have users, we wouldn't have security problems. OK. So the idea here is if we're going to share computers, we have to t protect these users from one another. We can't have a user's process crashing the entire machine or affecting other people's processes. We also want to give some kind of protection between um, online storage. If I can't read your files unless you let me. So those were the two main goals they were looking at in the 60s when they were inventing time sharing. Now, to do process protection, they were going to use hardware. And two different schemes showed up. One, segments in the GE 635. Okay, now segments were more like memory map files than segments that you might be familiar with in Intel processors. Right? It wasn't just a file offset. It was like a set of what we consider pages today. In the IBM 7094, they used what we're more familiar with, which is if you know about virtual memory systems, you know that they work on a page base. That is, whatever the page size is, say it's 4K or it could be 4 megabytes, when you run your process, a certain number of pages are allocated to your process. They are processes allowed to read memory only in those pages. If it tries to read memory outside of those pages, what happens? What's that famous error message? There's actually two of them. Sig false, segmentation violation. Okay, and that's hardware. Hardware actually says, oh, look at that. Try to access memory outside of one of its pages. End of program. Stops running. Okay, this is done in hardware. Now, there's one exception to who gets page faults. The way our computers are designed, our CPUs are designed, they have something called rings. Intel chips have four rings. Anything that has any kind of security has at least two rings. Now, we do have some embedded systems that don't have rings, right? Ring zero means you are like, it's like Lord of the Rings. 
you have total control. One ring that rules them all. So ring zero can read or write anywhere in memory. No restrictions. Remember where I talked about that in security in depth? If you can get inside of ring zero, you can do anything. Now, what about the users? The users needed file protection. And what we've got today really descends from Multics, the idea of access control list. Now you might say, Multics, whoa, Multics. Where do we see Multics? Well, from Multics came Unix, came Linux, and a very sort of lame form of an access control list is user group, other, read, write, execute. Pretty much what you see everywhere, right? Windows actually uses access control list. Now, the idea behind an access control list is that every object is represented by a file. So we can treat everything like a file. That was one of the, the big things that Multics came up with. It's a device, no, it's a, we can see it as a file. And it's a network socket. Mm, doesn't quite work, does it? Okay, users or groups may be granted or denied various types of access. So this is really the model in ACLs. We're gonna protect users from one another. You can say, I like John, he can write my files. I don't like Bob, he can't even read my files. Access control lists give you nice granularity. This later became multi-level secure systems. A child of the Department of Defense, which I'll have more to say about later. Also mandatory access controls. Search for truly secure computer and you'll find tens of thousands of hits and they all refer to some quote that I wasn't able to establish about a computer being buried in concrete. Okay? Unplugged is good too. So this is really the goal. We're gonna have a computer that we don't have to worry about it at all. Security is going to be absolute. And so far, the only way we've managed to do this is to take the computer and bury it under concrete with no power and certainly no wireless. You don't see a network cable coming out of that cement block either. So let's look at some solutions. MLS, capabilities, microkernels, micro VMs, reference monitors, and finally separation of privileges. Now the point of this, up to now I've just been talking about why we have sort of the pickle we're in how time sharing is really not a model for computing today. Think about it. They were trying to share a mainframe that filled, oh, half this room I'm standing in, required the kind of um, air, air handling systems that you require now for a room this size, <laughs> full of racks, so that's changed. But these machines were used by multiple people. How many people use most computers today? One. Okay, computers have become single user machines. How about a web server? How many users use that machine? Now, in a sense, there's many requests coming in, but from the point of view of the process model, there is one owner of that process. So that's also a single user machine. So how does Matt, how do access control list help us there? Okay, we now are using single user machines. We are not doing time sharing anymore. So, these are supposed solutions to get us away from doing time sharing like operating systems. Multi level secure systems like ATT, MLS, Sun, HP, IBM, HP, IBM all have MLS based systems. Who do they sell them to? Defense contractors, Department of Defense, people who have. Secure, uh, secure, secure and classified systems. What does that mean? Multiple levels of security, from secure but unclassified up to top secret. There's also categories that slice through here, right? How many, use, how many of us actually use a model that's anywhere like that? We don't. That's a model that's based on paper security classification systems by the military and the government. We don't use systems like this. This is a very poor match. SE Linux, this is a very popular solution in some ways. Fedora Core 5, Red Hat Enterprise, CentOS all have this built in, it comes with it. Very complex. How many people here have looked at a policy inside of SE Linux? 
Got a few hands, yeah. Well, that's how I feel like, too. I don't want to put my hand up like this because somebody might ask me a question. OK, it is just amazing. If you can use the CAM policy, say you can say, OK, control my web server. And it will control your web server using an access control list type of system. OK, it doesn't really solve the problem I would like to solve. And that, what the problem I'm trying to solve will become clearer as I go along with this. Um, how about App Armor? This is um, Crispin Cohen's Immunix was purchased by Novell. Now it's part of SUSE. And it's much easier to use. I've watched the, him debating with the NSA guys about SE Linux, no, App Armor. App Armor has usability features, which SE Linux severely lacks. Okay, which of course the SE Linux guys say, well, we're much more secure. They're using the same hooks into the kernel. If you can't use it, is it more secure? Well, maybe it's that cement block we were talking about. So, these are strong solutions that do not protect the user from her own web browser. It is not going to protect the web server from attacks within the data that's known, by, known to that web server. Anything the web server has in memory, that access control list, that SE Linux is not going to protect you. How about capabilities? Capabilities were invented just about the same time that people were coming up with access control list. Now, the difference between an access control list and a capability is basically that rather than we're going to take an object and put a list of who can see it, who can't, or who can write to it, who can't, we're going to say that the program itself has capabilities. Like the program can read files in a certain directory, write to one file, and say, open a network socket. And a good example of this is Eros. There's an, I'll have a, there's a list of references. There's the Eros operating system. This is a capabilities-based operating system done by Jonathan Shapiro, his graduate work, graduate studies work. And it's a nice example of capabilities. Un unusable because they never added networking. Makes it more secure, though. Then we have microkernels. Microkernels are supposed to be minimalist operating systems that just perform in the kernel a very minimal set of operations. In fact, what are these operations? These are those operations that you have to do in ring zero. Memory management, thread management, inter-process communication, everything else gets farmed out into user space. So we've managed to move all the cruft out of ring zero. Your file server crashes. Reboot it. I mean, just restart the file server. You don't have to reboot the system because the kernel's still running. That means you could actually be developing a new file server. <coughs> file system, excuse me, not file server. This is a great example of what's called least privilege. Right? What runs of all privileges? Right? The ring that rules them all, ring zero, is just the microkernel. It's really small. Okay? You have a file system. You have user management. You have networking. They all run in their own memory spaces. They all run as an individual task. Great example of least privilege. Oh, well. So let's look at some existing examples. Most popular one is Apple Mac OS X. Oh, boy. <clears throat> First, you take Mach 3, which is pretty big. Then you blend in the BSD interface, and Apple Core Services. Oops, it's not very micro anymore. It's been on a diet, the wrong kind of diet. I've gained weight. Let me, t sh I'll share with you how I did it, okay? Some device drivers may run outside of Ring Zero. It's possible to do that in Mac OS X. I asked when I was there Friday, they wouldn't tell me if, any, if they actually do this or not. Probably if they told me, I'd be under NDA and couldn't tell you. Then how about L4? L4 is a real microkernel project. And it's a real microkernel. It's just 4,000 lines, mostly C, some assembler. So it's a great example. In order to make it useful, they added the Linux API on top of it. So now we have about 400 system calls. Networking stack, how many file systems? It's not small anymore. Oh, well. Minix 3 comes the closest. It's a real microkernel, runs device drivers as services, and includes capabilities. 
So if you're going to run a device driver as a service, there's sort of a problem there because device drivers need access to memory. The way Minix 3 handles this, it says, OK, this device driver has the capabilities of reading th these things in memory, writing these bytes in memory, and so on. So it has least privileges, it has fine granularity, and the API is outside of the kernel. It runs X. It has networking. So if you want to look at a nice microkernel model, this is the one I'd recommend taking a look at today. Oh, by the way, you can run it in a VM if you like. And it's small. Now there's a hybrid approach. I meant to, I didn't mention this in my Apple talk. Yeah? So why do people abandon the microkernel approach? I mean, so I was working on SDR4 in the early 90s, and mm -hmm. I was fortunate to talk to somebody who understood operating system design. And the explanation I got was that microkernel performance sucks because you keep crossing the boundary of permissions and it's very expensive to do so for every call you make. That's right. For a service. There is a real problem with microkernels, or let's say a real perceived problem with microkernels. And the, the problem is, yeah. <clears throat> uh, Essentially what you said is you were working a System 5 release 4 in the early 90s and you were exposed to microkernels then and they essentially died and the reason they died was there, there were performance issues. And there really are performance issues and can I write somewhere? Maybe... Um, what, the whiteboard, I guess. <laughs> Well, it doesn't matter. I can't find a pen. Let's, you're going to have to do, you have to just do um, air drawings. User process, user process, my head is a microkernel. OK? So we go from user process A, IPC, contact switch into the microkernel. Microkernel then, contact switches back out to user process B. User process B, say, the file system. So now we have a block. We're going to return it. Context switch, IPC. Context switch, IPC. Four context switches. Now, how many people here know what a context switch is? Yay! Oh boy, you guys are so much better than Apple. Oops. <laughs> OK, four context switches. That's pretty painful. Context switches cost a lot because you've got to shave, you got to change stacks, you've got to change every, you've got to save everything that's all, in all your registers, how many registers you've got, right? And all we want to do is talk between these two processes, and we've got to do that four times. Now, there's a way around this, I believe, and I'm going to save that for later. But thanks for the question. Well, I got this in my hand, so I don't have to hold my hands up again. A, B. MK for microkernel, or well, I'll have to call it MK instead of, right? In here, out here, in here, out here. One, two, three, four context switches. That's the pain. Okay, it looks like it's a great concept. I like the concept. But so far, it hasn't worked for really two reasons. One, people consider the context switching too painful. Uh, Andy Tannenbaum, who's in charge of Minix 3, doesn't think so. And I think there's actually a solution to this. So the other thing about the microkernel is, how do you use it? OK, this is the layering on of system call APIs, device drivers, file systems, networking. That's what's killed. Say, you know, to say that Mac OS X has a microkernel, it's more like saying it has a microkernel embedded in the kernel. That's the reality. That's the sad reality. Did I miss something there? The hybrid approach, yeah. OK. Now, there's an experimental operating system. It's really funny. I was looking at the names on the papers, and one of the names on the papers is Robert Morris. I see a few smiles in the room. Robert Morris wrote The Internet Worm to show us how insecure we were in 1988. Boy, we've come a long ways, huh? So he has work, he's working with people on asbestos. And the idea here is this is also sounds a little bit like a microkernel. So I had a hard time fitting it in. It does data labeling, which makes it sound like MLS, right? Because right? it's also mandatory and, or discretionary access control. But what the data, level, data label, labeling really means is that, say, you have a web server. 
someone connects to the web server and their data, as it passes through the web server, has a label associated with it. Somebody else connects to the multi-threaded web server in the same memory space, and their connection and their input gets a different label. Labels can only get more restrictive over time. So if we have some malicious input that causes a buffer overflow and then tries to get the web server to misbehave, that code has been labeled with a very restrictive label that's going to protect, protect the rest of memory. That's the theory. Now, I don't really know a whole lot about this, but how they do the labeling, it's done in pages in memory. Pages in memory are like 4K. So if you have a get request, that's a lot of memory, but hey, memory is cheaper these days. So looks interesting. I don't really, haven't really got to look very deeply into this one yet. How about virtual machines? This often gets touted as a, a way of doing security, but is it really? Not really, because what do you run inside of a virtual machine? a copy of an operating system with all its flaws and weaknesses and insecurity and depth. What we get out of virtual machines is the ability to replace it. If it gets compromised, you just put in a new image and start over again. You have isolation between VMs. That's nice. That's actually getting better because Intel and AMD are actually giving you hardware hypervisor support. So we have stronger isolation between virtual machines. Um, the you know, Department of Defense actually likes this because theoretically now they can run multiple levels of security on the same box in different VMs and rely on the VMs to do compartmentalization. But that doesn't solve our problem. It really doesn't. You still can't run a web browser and not expect someone to steal your secrets. The reference monitor. The reference monitor forces applications to match execution profile. SysTrace is our best current example. So we have the author of SysTrace sitting in the front row here. Yeah, Niels? You want to take a bow? No, no, I didn't think so. OK. <clears throat> I didn't just put this in here because I knew Niels would be here, by the way. I like the idea behind SysTrace. Essentially, you can use a tool to create your profile. Boy, that beats the pants off SE Linux, right? which you can put in logging mode, and then you have a mess which you may be able to convert into a, some kind of a, po a policy after a while. Essentially what SysTrace does is it captures system calls. When it captures the system calls, it canonicalizes path names so people can't play games of path names when they're trying to access objects. The profile that it creates is simple enough that you can actually hand edit it. You know, it falls into the category of stuff that I like, um, say Python versus Perl, where if you start reading Python and you've seen the programming language before, you understand it. If you start reading Perl, if you don't know how Perl works, you won't understand it because it's not all there. Same thing with the profiles here. The profiles are easy enough to read. If you understand what a system call is and what a path name is, what a network socket is, it's going to work for you. So that's very nice. Okay, but it doesn't really have the granularity that I'm looking for, right? Because I still can't protect a web browser user from herself. Oh, one other thing I should mention about reference monitor. Exceptions may be handled without killing the process. Now, it's only if you're using it interactively, but most of our other solutions we talked about, like things like stack guard, right? There's a violation or it kills the process. That's how it handles it. Oh, I'm sorry, you did the wrong thing. Oh, bad. Yes. So, Rick, I have to speak up with the fence just a little bit. Yes, go ahead. So, the way that I run the browser. Oh, you're really close. Could you use this so I don't have to try to repeat sure. what you're saying? Is it on? I turn it on. Okay, just a you know, quick sentence in defense of SysTrace, <laughs> just because I'm sitting here. Um, so the way that you would like to run a web browser under SysTrace is to put a very restrictive policy on it, and then because the web browser is interactive anyway, you get the SysTrace uh, policy notifications out of band of the real web, server, web browser process, and that way, if you do something that you would expect to lead to a file being written somewhere or a file being read somewhere or a network connection being open somewhere, you sort of get this notification out of band of the web browser and you can OK it. And when you get the notification that you didn't expect, then that usually means that something went wrong and you can just uh, deny it um, 
out of band from the web browser again. And that sort of gets you a little bit closer okay. to where you want to be. Thank you. So I don't have to repeat that. Now, what I think are the problems with that are, <laughs> number one, have you ever known of a user who got a dialog box that said, um, cancel or continue? What do they do? Continue. I want my porn. Oh, porn, yeah, whatever. OK, um, so there's, a, there's an issue with that. You can't trust users to do the right thing. You have to do it for them. So for you running SysTrace, I think that's going to work fine. For most of the people running SysTrace, that's going to work fine. People in this room, I mean, not just anyone. And people who are also uh, video conferenced in. Sure. But this is not our target audience. Our target audience are people who are not computer experts. And what about we have a web browser. We're watching the syscalls. We have a. You don't get data protection or anything like that. Yeah, you don't have any data protection. So somebody has a buffer overflow. What the buffer overflow is going to do is this. It's going to run a little program. It's going to search the memory space of the web browser looking for at signs. At signs. Why at signs? Because lots of usernames are username at. And then you capture that information, whatever follows it in memory, and that's probably username password. Okay? You also search for 16 digits. Why 16 digits? Credit card number, right? It even has a built-in checksum. You collect all that up, and then it's a web browser. You visit a website. And SysTrace is going to allow that as well. So it doesn't, it's good, and I like what the reference monitor does, and I want, you know, this is a good example of how you take a program and you, you monitor its behavior so you're going to keep it from misbehaving, but only up to a certain level. Now, separation of privileges is a, something that we've danced around a bit already. The idea behind separation of privilege is to do divide and conquer. We're going to separate a service into smaller programs. Run most of these programs with minimal privilege. Privilege is granted only to programs that require privileges. Postfix as a nice example. right? Postfix was written from scratch because Betsy Venema got tired of dealing with send mail bugs. I mean, send mail, think about it. 2003, um, three buffer overflows discovered, uh, two in April, one in September. Um, exploit by LSD, very cool exploit by LSD for taking advantage of the buffer overflow. How long had that buffer overflow been in this open source code and nobody saw it? I'm guessing a little over 20 years. OK? When this came out, I got the patch, looked at the, you know, what's a patch, right? It's a diff file. So you could see exactly what's being modified. And what looked really interesting was the checkouter function. And indeed, that's where the buffer overflow was. Well, then I started hand stepping through checkouter. Oh my god. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Eric. Eric Allman wrote SendMail as a, this is one of those things you do. You do as a student project because you're, you're, you're just not satisfied with your email server solution in 1981 or 82. It was never designed to be shared with tens of millions of people. And some of the code looks like that, including Checkouter. Checkouter is designed to parse an email address, right? And what do you see if you look at the from line, from colon line in your email? You'll see name, angle bracket, email address, close angle bracket. OK, that's supposed to fit in 256 bytes according to um, RFC um, 28, uh, I'm forgetting it, 2821, I believe it is. I'm, I don't, it's either 21 or 22. But the idea is this is supposed to fit in 20, 256 bytes. And exactly 256 bytes are allocated for this on the heap, not on the stack. So Canary's not going to help you. Okay, so what was wrong is every time they saw a right angle bracket, they would, let's see, uh, left angle bracket, excuse me, but I use my right hand for you. They would then decrement a counter, and when they'd see the right angle bracket, they would increment the counter, except they forgot to increment the counter again. That's what was missing. And it was a very subtle error, and you really had to single step through it to find it. 
So you just set pairs of angle brackets like this, and that would increase the length that you could, you could then fill into the heap. You could overwrite part of the heap and take control of the program. Now, the actual exploit was sent as a very long data line. And so then you would have, you would find a file structure open file structures inside of a program actually have callback pointers. They overwrite one of the callback pointers. So when it read, went to read the file, it would actually jump into the routine that was stored on the heap. That was part of the email data. And what did they do with this? They opened a connection to port 25 at the IP address of the attacker's choosing. Port 25, that's what a mail server uses. Oh my god, what firewall. Okay, and then they exact a shell as root because Samuel runs as root. Whew. Okay, all of a sudden Postfix is starting to look really good. Okay, simple enough to verify. Everything is simple and very little runs as root. You don't parse your email addresses while you're running as root. That's the point of that long story. And then there's other things like um, G.J. Bernstein's DNS and other things. He's such an annoying person to deal with. You know, it's sort of hard, but he does deserve mention at least. <clears throat> so, my personal favorite is separation of privileges. This is something we can do today. You know, instead of writing large, convoluted applications, you actually build this into your design. Right? You build modules that do limited things that require privilege, and everything else runs without privileges. And you keep everything as simple as possible. This is almost like capabilities, right? Because you write something that's all it's designed to do, say using Postfix as an example, you write something that listens to port 25. Something connects to port 25. It does RFC 822, right? Um, hello, mail from, receipt to, data. And it saves that all into a blob, a, a file. Okay, then something else comes along and says, oh look, there's something in the incoming directory. And it starts processing. And then there's an, yet another step in processing it before it ever gets forwarded to anyone. But the only thing that's happening at the root level is that initial, I'm opening a socket port 25. That's it. Everything else is done as a non-privileged user. Now, how's it like capabilities? Each little program is doing something very, very simple. We're taking advantage of that this is a process that's only allowed to read its own memory. It can't read anybody else's memory. It's still running as one single user, but what's happening here is we're actually spawning yet another process. So it's not perfect, but it's sort of like capabilities. So I consider this best practice with today's technology. Um, well, when I say anybody can do this, we're not all Betsy Venema, unfortunately. So, here we get to the blue sky portion, and then we're gonna, we're gonna finish on the original time schedule, it looks like. None of these solutions prevent overfl buffer overflows, right? I haven't really solved the problem of running somebody else's code within my web browser without a buffer overflow, or with some kind of an exploit that's going to run my attacker's code of choice. The separation of privilege makes things easier because we've reduced the number of lines of code, right? Now we have simpler, smaller, more easily understood programs. Reduce the chance of a root compromise, right? Not as much as going on at ring zero. But it does not solve the web browser problem. If we could start over, here's what I'd like to do. Programs would be broken into small tasks. Each task runs within its own thread. So I'm talking really not lightweight threads that run within the context of one process. I'm talking about treating a thread as a true independent entity with its own memory space. So now I can use rings, I can use memory management to prevent it from looking at memory within other processes, other threads, as I'm calling them. Each task is actually restricted by something, by a reference monitor, by capabilities. I don't really care. Since you wrote the task, it's really simple. You can say, this task is supposed to do this. Now, as an example, not so long ago, there was a exploitable condition 
in JPEG rendering. How often do you look at JPEGs? What do you use to look at JPEGs? Your web browser. So somebody could send you a picture, or you could visit some site that had a picture on it, that would then do a buffer overflow within the context of your web browser and own you. It could do anything you could do. Now suppose that JPEG renderer, which actually is one function, one functional unit, was its own task. It read from an input stream and had an output stream that would only write bits to your display. Now it can no longer read your passwords, your credit card numbers. It can't make network connections. It can't spawn processes. All it can do is do what it's supposed to do. It's a JPEG renderer. It's nothing more. Now, let's go back to our microkernel. Here's our microkernel. Here's our problem with the microkernel, right? We've got these four context switches going on. One, two, three, four. Now what's changing today is instead of having a microkernel that runs on one CPU, we now have multi-core chips. This is becoming common. You know, from the simple of having two core chips, we're going to have true four core chips by next spring. You know, Intel's going to fake it. They're going to put two two core chips on one package and call it four cores, right? That's not really four cores in my book. This is not closely coupled, right? We're going to see multi-core. By the way, Spark already has an eight core chip called the T1. So this is where things are going. We've miniaturized things to the point that we can have multiple complete CPUs on a single chip. So if we have a single chip, I'm going to hy hypothesize a, just because it's convenient, a five core processor. So I don't have to worry about any um, ever having to claim that I invented this idea because no one's going to do a five core processor. Well, we'll see. And then I'm going to take my microkernel and I'm going to always run it on one of these processors. Hmm. Now, associated with this, we also have level one cache. Level 1 cache is designed to run at processor speed. The big problem with level 1 cache is, of course, having to do address translation. But since it's only going to be doing this one task, we don't even have to do address translation. Um, this doesn't have to be very big. We could probably run it in, say, 16K. Not a whole lot of level 1 cache. Very doable with today's technology. So what do I win with this? What do I get out of this? I now have a kernel that does not ever do context switches. Somebody calls in, I don't have to change my context, right? I have my own register set. No context switch, I can do IPC with other running threads with no context switch. So now I've solved the problem that we used to have with microkernels. I didn't really solve it. Technology has solved this problem, right? Now we have the ability to have multiple CPU cores all running. Why not bind the microkernel, which is this little piece that just talks to things and has to run with privilege, to one of these cores? Yes? Well, well looking at this as kind of a client-server model where A is the client asking a service of B, then let's say you tied A to one of them, the kernel to another, and the B to another. Only one of those three CPUs would ever be doing anything. You'd have the potential for 3x the amount of work you actually get. Uh, what I would actually, OK, the, so the question was, if I tie A and B to cores as well, I'm going to run into problems. I'm not going to tie A and B to cores. But then we're still context switching on the core. Yeah. No, I'm going to be context switching on all the other cores except the one running the microkernel. So I can still do time slicing just the way we do, pro just the way our operating systems run today. All I'm doing is, is removing the four context switches that microkernels involve. Yes? Well, what is doing the, uh, the time slicing, et cetera, like, of the other cores? The scheduler. The scheduler runs as its own task. And what happens is that whenever a process goes to exit, we have our C runtime saying, I'm calling underscore exit. 
I'm done. Right? Any, or say, process B goes, I want to read the, the hard drive. So it communicates with A. A says, oops, I'm sorry, you're going to have to wait about 10 milliseconds for the disk, in which case we're going to have to talk to the scheduler and saying, this is going to wait too long. A is actually going to have to say to the microkernel, put this guy to sleep. Yeah? Well, um, what exactly does process A do when it wants to talk to the microkernel? Essentially, it's going to do what we've always done. There's going to be a system call library. The system call library is going to convert oh, this uh, into, yeah? A, a library, uh, as I'm used to, it just runs in the same context as the uh, process that uses it, have the same privileges. I want to know what does it do to actually ah. communicate. Good point. And actually, I shouldn't say there is a system call library. The last thing I want to do is take my little tiny task and add libc to it. OK? Now, this is why I call this blue sky. Because we'd actually have to be writing at, we'd actually have to have a new programming language to make this feasible. Because we'd have to say, OK, I'm running a module. It has these capabilities. And here's how it's going to communicate. It has to be done in some way that ordinary people can use it. If ordinary people can't use this, it's going to be useless. So what I'm saying is, say process B wants to talk to the file system. If it looks like C, it's really going to look like C to the user. The user is going to say, open file. And it's going to get back a file handle object, right? Just like we do today. Under the covers, though, what's going to happen is there's going to be a little magic going on. And the magic will be that it's actually going to make an IPC to the kernel, say to the kernel, hello, I want to open a file. And then the kernel goes off and talks to the file system. So how do you do this IPC? Is it a virtual machine? Is it a new hardware design? Or? I think that some of what I'm talking about is a new hardware design. To be really honest, I'm throwing this out. Remember, the slide says blue sky. I don't have all the answers. Part of what I wanted to do is I've been thinking about this for a long time. I wanted the opportunity to come in front of a bunch of really bright people and say, look, I would like you to think about this. I'd like you to shoot holes in it. I'd like you to feed back to me what you think might work and what wouldn't work about it. Maybe this is totally useless, OK, and maybe not. A lot of times, the way IPC can be done is we don't copy the data back and forth. What we actually do is you say, OK, I read the block from the hard drive. It's here in memory. The microkernel, which manages memory, then maps that page of memory to process B. Now, process B of zero copying now has the data that it wanted. Ooh, that's sort of nice. All, all that is is um, page management software. Of course, all, I'm saying all it is is virtual memory management. Boy, isn't that simple stuff, right? It's not simple, but I think this could be done. Yes? So um, right now, the solution you've talked about has been things that involve um, essentially allowing a user to write machine code. Um, mm -hmm. and what are the thoughts about something that, um, so like, for example, Microsoft has a Harmony project. Um, I think it's called Harmony. Singularity, or, perhaps? Singularity, maybe. I, I, there, where you run, um, I'm sorry, do I have the wrong name? It, it's, it's a project where essentially the device drivers run as processes. Oh, OK. And then all the I'll user -like programs else. are written in some um, like interpreted language, essentially bytecode. Mm -hmm. And so you can guarantee in the structure of bytecode that you can't do anything that doesn't fulfill whatever you know, whatever restrictions you want, whether they're capabilities or apples or whatever, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. And so then you essentially have a safe system by virtue of restricting the code. And then you can add hardware acceleration to accelerate the bytecode if you want. Mm -hmm. um, but that's another step. You can still run it on a generic processor. Because so, on some level, what you're talking about is building mm -hmm. a completely new API to a completely new programming paradigm. Because you're no longer making mm -hmm. those again. So essentially, I. Is that exactly uh, how Java is supposed to be working? How what? Java. Java. C sharp. Do these, have these things had any bugs in security? Well, their yes. Problem, well, their problem on some level is that they do not do the second part, which is to implement a good way to restrict the security now that you have it. Also, Java does a really ratty job because, I mean, it allows you to have static variables. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, things are kind of wacky there. 
Yeah, okay, just to repeat the question. You, you, said, um, you were talking about a Microsoft project, it may be called Harmony, which essentially has um, runs device drivers without privilege, which is one of the things I'm talking about. Um, all user applications run as bytecode rather than as assembler, and we're going to rely on the features of the language and the hardware that the bytecode runs on to limit, ex to control and provide security. Sounds reasonable. Uh, my pr as long as you say the word hardware in there, I feel a little better, but I still have some problems with this. Part of the problem I have is Java as an example. Java as an example has worked very poorly. Okay, it's bytecode interpreter, it's supposed to have security, really doesn't. Um, it's not just the static variables that are a problem with Java, how about reflection? Or is it called reflection, introspection, where you can look, say you have a private method inside of Java. How private is it? You can actually use reflection to find out what methods are private and then you can call them. Oops, that violates the security model right there. There's a, pro there's a project called uh, Joe E where someone is actually trying to make Java more secure, actually, actually follow its own security model better. Some guys at Berkeley working on this. So I don't really trust that. I mean, another project I don't really like is Singularity, which is everything, run this is another Microsoft project, experimental microkernel design, everything runs in ring zero, so you have no context switching. Wow, and we're gonna rely on the features of the language for security. Oh, maybe that is what I'm talking about. Yeah, it could be the same thing, because yeah. I don't know that much about it, but it just scares uh, out of me. Niels. I would like to bring up something completely different. These days, yeah. you see a lot of security problems actually operating at a much higher level. Where you have, um, you know, you have applications interacting with each other, or predefined APIs, I mean, take uh, SQL injection, or cross-site scripting, where really um, all of these sort of low-level security mechanisms are sold by you, right? Right. Do you have any thoughts on that matter? Okay. Neil's just asking about what about things like SQL injection, where we, what we really have is to pick a common example. You have a web server that's talking to an Oracle database or a MySQL database. Someone is going to send malicious SQL code as part of a regular allowed query and then do things that are not allowed. And the, my answer is no. My solution, what I'm talking about here, doesn't really have any impact on that at all. And it's, I really, to be honest, I wasn't thinking about that problem when I was looking at this. That's one reason why I'm not really looking at that. Um, the other is that it just seems to me somehow that we could manage to build input filters that would be good enough so we couldn't do SQL injection, maybe. Well, it's sort of like saying I write programs with a buffer overflows. Yes. It is like saying writing programs with no buffer overflows. And I don't really have a good answer to this. I mean, really, part of what I'm trying to get around is that programmers are generally not geniuses. Okay? There are some programmers that are geniuses, but not all programmers are geniuses. Even programmers that are geniuses make mistakes. There have been security flaws in PostFix, as a nice example. I know genius programmers. I, I found bugs in their code, and I'm not a genius, okay? So I would like to have a solution that made it programming like driving a car, right? You could have a sub-average sub IQ and still know how to drive a car, but I don't think we're going to get there. Um, I don't think, I don't have a solution to SQL injection or PHP file include, and I don't really know what to do about that. It's a good question, because I think that's another large topic. It's just not really what I was focused on in this talk. Well, okay, so you're, to repeat the question, IPC has failed because it's not a very efficient mechanism in general. And I'm arguing that we may be able to make this, it may be now an, effic, an effective mechanism. Andy Tannenbaum has been arguing that he believes it is, that it is as fast, you know, he, if you go visit his website, which I'll have a link for, it's easy, it's Minix 3. To search for Minix 3, you'll find it. That he's doing IPC as fast. And what part of how he does IPC is he has fixed length message blocks. And he's doing tricks with virtual memory, like I was talking about, to pass the data back and forth. So is this really possible? I don't know. The other idea, I guess part of what got me on this thread as well was, 
when I'd be talking to people like John, Jonathan Shapiro, who did Eros, or Andy Tenenbaum, who did Minix, and other folks, is if you could have your own CPU design, what features would you put in it? And they just go, I don't want to do that. I'm going, why not? Why not? We are still building the same CPU that was based on a calculator, the 4004, which later became the 8080. Okay? That's our design. Oh my God, this is awful. Why are we still doing, we're going down the same road that we've been going down all this time. Attempts to create new processors, and most of them in a commercial sense have failed unless you look at it embedded applications where people don't try to put new applications on them or use generic applications. Yeah. The portability, I mean, I've worked on a lot of RISC architectures that, you know, I860, PA RISC, mm -hmm. um, recently I64, and a few others in between that all of them have unique features that make them very interesting. Some of them have better security, like you're talking about executable stack mm -hmm. or non-executable right. stack. And those features don't make or break the commercial viability of the processor. And those volumes and those abilities to create it. So that's why Andy Tannenbaum and a lot of these people have a real hard time sort of visualizing what they can do with the processor because in order to get the volume up, somebody has to use it. In order to get people to use it, there has to be software. And mm -hmm. you have this vicious cycle of trying to kick, get one of those things off the ground. It's exactly. Very, very it's sort of like you have this wonderful piece of hardware. I, mean, I used to review hardware in the late 80s, early 90s. I would get a, it was sort of a cool time for me. I was um, a tech, technical editor of Unix World Magazine as one of my consulting gigs. So I got paid to read the magazine. I got paid to write hardware reviews. I would get the new hot workstation du jour. And when I was finished using it, I would copy my files over to the next new hot workstation du jour. OK? And the problem they all faced was applications. If you don't have that application base, you do nothing. I don't know. How are we doing on time? Um, it's like 10 quarter past four. Okay. Well, I'm going to go ahead and not end this, but I'm going to like do a couple more slides. We can keep talking because we have another 10 minutes or so, 20 minutes. Think of that truly secure computer that I showed you earlier, right? It was buried in concrete. Controls the access really well. I mean, that was the idea behind this old saying. You know, the only true, truly secure computer is buried in cement or concrete. Each task will be buried. That was a concept. We're going to take a task, we're going to bury it in concrete and give it two little windows, or as many little windows as it needs, but as few as possible. So that's the capabilities, that's the reference monitor. It's isolated from other data, prevented from causing harm outside its own threat. That's what I'm suggesting. Now you can take that and you can use that today when you write your code, think of least privilege. Right? Try to avoid writing huge things, especially if they have a large attack surface. What has a large attack surface? Anything that listens to a network software socket is a nice example of that. Anything that re receives requests from anywhere. Web servers, great example. Another great example that really scares me is MDNS Responder. I don't know if any of you have looked at that. Bonjour. Very exciting stuff. I want to see this stuff compartmentalized. I don't want to see one giant C module that listens to the network and says, oh, I've got one of those here. You want it? And it's going to interpret things it's reading off the network. OK. Um, so to, to try to repeat what you said, uh, w one of the issues is how do I break up a program, you know, X, Y, Z, SCR, into the smaller pieces, and then how do I assign the capabilities to them? And then if I do assign the capabilities, how do I keep, um, say, process A from exceeding its authorization, perhaps because process A has been hacked? And also, who determines the capabilities? Well, who determines the capabilities? In the model I'm envisioning, the programmer who's writing the program or the designer who's designing this would actually say, here's this module. It needs to convert JPEG streams into bitmaps that are going to be displayed on the screen. So that's, a, that, I mean, that's just so easy. 
unfortunately. That's why I pick it as an example. It's a valid example, but it's nice and clean because I get an input stream that's supposed to be JPEG formatted, and what I put out are just bits. Okay, and that's all I'm going to be is, is putting out bits. You know, this is a web browser. I've already been told what size, how much screen real estate I get. So I, it's really, well, somebody at Apple made the comment, which I'd like to repeat here, and I think I can easily repeat, because it bears on your question. Um, one of the problems of a capability style system, as I'm mentioning here, is really a lot of times what it's doing is just moving the problem somewhere else. Okay, we can't really s eliminate the problem. So that's a flaw in my reasoning. Yes, sir. Well, when you take this in JPEG example, so the way you would design the policy would be that the policy just says it, this module can read a stream of data from here and write a stream of data to uh, to uh, to preserve the weight for the uh, for the bitmap. You, you're not trying to put the the, the of the policy. No. In this case, I'm just saying I'm expecting a stream of bits that I'm going to write out into this rectangular area of the screen. Now, that's pretty safe. Now, suppose what I'm saying is I'm going to be passing a stream of bits in here, and what this is is a file converter. So I'm going to take PDF and convert it into HTML. Okay, so now I'm taking data in and I'm putting data out. How can I prove that the data out I'm going to create is not going to be harmful? Because it's going to be interpreted somewhere else down the line by yet another module that's expecting real HTML. So that's, I, is that sort of what you're saying? Well, the, the, the nice thing about converting a PDF to a bitmap is that the bitmap, for, the bitmap format is so simple. Yes. That it's hard to do wrong. OK. Gotcha. Excuse me. Yeah, the bitmap format is really simple. That's why I say, let's do PDF into HTML, which is something that Google Search does, right? You find a PDF file, and there's a button you can click and says, oh, read as HTML. So that means that you're running a converter. Right? You're running a converter. Well, now what we've created is we're not creating a bitmap. We're actually creating HTML. And can HTML be harmful? Yeah, definitely. So if somebody figures out how to exploit your PDF converter on the right PDF file, now it's got to be an interesting enough file. Yes. Porn. It's the answer to well, everything, yes. Well, without knowing exactly how the uh, converter works, I would say that this shouldn't be a problem because it's uh, the HTML files is being fitted to a system which should already be designed to handle arbitrary HTML files, however malicious they are. Yeah, well, I'm sorry. That doesn't seem to be the case today. And actually, we need to wrap things up now. So I'm going to have to leave you with those thoughts. I'm also going to mention that I put a page up on my home site. Oh, oh, let me leave you with these thoughts. If security was easy, we would have done it already. If it could be bought, Microsoft would have paid for it, right? Oh, Google could buy it too, right? No problem. Solution will take thinking outside the box of history and look outside the cement block of the past. That's what I want to leave you with. I have two pages of references. And how you find the references I forgot to put in this. Ooh, isn't that clever? My website is spirit.com. So if you can remember the word spirit, then if you can remember the name Google, you put in spirit.com slash Google HTML, it'll get you these references and a, a link to the presentation. So you can read it at your leisure. My email address is rik at spirit.com. It's on the slides. Send me email if you have more thoughts about this. I mean, if you know, if you say that was really stupid, I want to hear it. If you say, I think I have a solution here, I really want to hear it. I want to hear both things because I really would like to be part of creating a solution, at least a part of this problem. Maybe this goes nowhere, but what I've seen so far is that what we've done so far hasn't worked. So we've got to do something different. Thanks very much. Thank you.